It's been recently revealed that One Piece's first editor released never seen before earliest prototype of One Piece, a prototype named Forward, dated to have been created around 1994 and we have to talk about it. So based on the news I've seen, this information has been released in a Monsters guidebook. And for those of you who don't know, Monsters is another earlier prototype or one-shot created by Oda, developed before the publication of One Piece, published in 1994. And Monsters itself has actually been canonized in the One Piece universe. It centers around a protagonist named Ryuma, whom we know from Thriller Bark and the Wano arc. And Monsters was also recently animated in 2023. But this this guidebook seems to contain information about another earlier prototype, in fact the earliest prototype of One Piece, something that has never been released before. And although the reports I've read actually hasn't named the editor himself, it's always said the first editor of Oda or the first editor of One Piece. I'm assuming that means Takanori Asada-san, whom I know to have been One Piece's first editor via other sources. And I actually also have read a very sweet story about Oda and Asada. Asada-san and how we basically owe everything to Asada-san because without him we may have never ended up with One Piece. But I'll share that story at the end so make sure to stick around for that. So this prototype forward is said to have been created or developed around 1994 and that would place Oda at around 19 years old and it's also the same time that Monsters was published. So it seems like the two stories, Monsters and the early conception of One Piece were developed almost around the same same time and then merged into one. Which is obviously very interesting because of what we know about Ryuma and his connection to Zoro. Anyways, while we have known about monsters as well as Oda's other one-shots like the two versions of Romance Dawn for quite a long time now, all of those have been published previously. Like I said, this is the first time we've ever heard of Forward. And it's really amazing to see just how much of Oda's original plans have remained and what has changed throughout the years. And for some, perhaps the most interesting is what may have been Oda's original plan for Nika, the idea of devil fruits, and perhaps even the creation of Joy Boy, as many have speculated. Because it seems like the reveals from Forward, or the bits of information that we got about Forward, might shed some light into some of the law field mysteries that we've been wondering about for decades. But I think I'm getting a bit ahead of myself, so let me just try to explain this logically. So firstly, I think it's interesting to see what Oda's original plans for One Piece was, or then named Forward, was going to be. Because I think the first place to start is that it seems like Forward might not have actually been planned to be a specifically pirate manga. The main character, then named Monkey D. Pao, was going to be a thief. And I guess a thief is sort of a pirate, or rather I guess a pirate is a type of thief because they are typically known to be seafaring thieves. So maybe Oda had the idea of piracy from the very beginning, but Pao is just described to be a thief not necessarily a pirate. But we also know from other sources that Oda was also interested in pirates from a very young age, that because of a TV series, an animated kids TV show called Vicky the Vikings, and so he's always had this idea of some sort of seafaring adventure. Anyways, Monkey D. Pal, the earliest rendition of Monkey D. Luffy, an optimistic boy whose appearance seems very much like Luffy. You can also see hints of Shanks in there, but I think it's very clear that this is an early conception of the boy that would eventually become Luffy. And although Pal was going to be a thief, that was obviously a storyline that was given to Nami by the end. And perhaps more importantly, the D initial in his name. So I think it's fascinating that that idea of the will of the D or that mysterious D name is something that has been on Oda's mind for at least 30 years. We don't know how much of his original plans for this D initial or this D clan has changed, but to something that that's something he has wanted to keep in his story for 
literally decades, really emphasizes just how important this D business is and how crucial or how central it is to the entire lore of One Piece. Just really makes the mystery all that more appealing. Monkey is obviously also a name that has stuck with Oda, so again, another very important name. And I wonder whether that's just because of the importance and the significance of the Sun King Wukong legend, or maybe the influences of Dragon Ball, or because there is actually a lot more importance, maybe a lot more lore tied to the Monkey family name. You know, maybe there's some real significance of the Monkey D family in particular, which which I guess isn't really hard to see given that Luffy is such a central character, his grandfather, his father, they're all big names in the One Piece universe and I wonder whether that has something to do with their family history. If you think about the monkey in general, I can't help but make connections to the swirl design that's also used for Monkey D. Pao. He's wearing a bandana with these, you know, the swirl designs that has been used for devil fruits instead. And now I like to think that that swirl might actually be inspired by a monkey tail. You know, the swirl sort of resembles that the way that monkey tails curl up or how they're often drawn in media. And I wonder whether that's how Oda got the design. You know, maybe there's going to be a real significance between monkey, devil fruits, and the whole lore of it all. And I guess in which case, that would really strengthen the idea that the monkey family is actually quite important and central to the story. Now, Pal, the name of Pao, I'm not really too sure of the significance of that name. For me, it just reminds me of Kung Pao Chicken, which I find quite unlikely to be of any significance. Maybe it's supposed to be like a nickname, it's short for Paolo, which is a popular, I think, Latin American name. I stand corrected, apparently Paolo is actually the Italian version of the name Paul, and so maybe then it's actually gonna have a lot of Christian or biblical significance, which is also not too left field because there are heaps of biblical imagery and biblical themes in One Piece. But then again, Pal was obviously abandoned, we ended up with Monkey D. Luffy instead. But this name Pal might still be of significance, and I'll share with you why in a little bit. Personality-wise, Pal was still going to be the very similar, plucky, optimistic young man that we see in Luffy. He says things like, anything is better than rock bottom. That's why I'm so glad because if I hit rock bottom, then that means I just got to start anew. And which does feel like a quote that Luffy could say, or at least some version of Luffy would say. I could really picture the live action version of Luffy saying a line like this. But regardless, you definitely get that feeling of sheer will, sheer determination, that indomitable spirit that we know that the current day Luffy is very well known for. And so it's really cool to see how much of Oda's original plans have remained throughout the years and remain true because it also seems like Pal was always intended to have some sort of stretching ability. It also says that he can fall asleep and I'm not really too sure how to interpret that. Does that mean that sleep is some sort of side effect? Like if he stretches too much then he needs sleep to recuperate? Is being able to sleep a power in and of itself? Or is it just a character trait? Because if it is just a character trait then that seems to be something that has been given to Zoro instead. How is also seen holding an axe, which is interesting because we know from other early character designs and developments that Oda's also considered giving Nami an axe as a choice of weapon. So I guess Oda really likes this idea or likes this design or combat involving an axe. And it's something that he's obviously tried to keep a part of his series as a pretty significant fighting style, seeing as he has passed the weapon around between multiple characters, between multiple main characters. Which then makes it all the more interesting that in the canon One Piece that we have, none of the Straw Hats actually ended up with an axe. So if the axe fighting is something that Oda holds truly dear, I really wonder, you know, about the significance of characters like Scopa Gaban, you know, his role in the story that we have yet to really 
see the significance of because he's obviously a character that fans are so eager to see. Every time there's like a mystery character, we're all like, Scopa, Scopa, Scopa. When is Scopa Gaban's, you know, time to shine? When are we going to get the reunion? When are we going to see Luffy meet Scopa? But obviously, as one of the characters that fights with an axe, you can't help but wonder and get excited about the potential future importance he might have in the series. Although Oda may have satisfied his axe wielding combat scenes from Axe Hand Morgan, I guess we'll just have to see. Anyways, what is really interesting about Pao is that the word on the street is that Pao might turn out to be a very important character in the One Piece canon, not just because he was the early inspiration or the early prototype for Luffy, but people are even thinking that Pao might be become a character in and of himself in the series because he may be revealed to be the first Joy Boy or the original Joy Boy or at least an earlier Joy Boy. And this speculation seems to rest a lot on Oda's character design and his early conception of Zoro because Zoro, as we know, was first conceived as Ryuma. So the fact that Ryuma, who does actually now exist in the One Piece canon, was also the prototype for Zoro and that being confirmed in this monster's guidebook isn't too much of a surprise. We've known of Ryuma for a while now. He was the protagonist of Monsters, which as I said, was published in 1994. And then he also appeared in future arcs in the actual One Piece series. And so it's been long assumed that Zoro was loosely inspired by Ryuma or that Oda kept some of his character designs in developing Zoro himself. And so again, now it has of course been confirmed in the Monsters Guidebook that Ryuma was indeed the earliest prototype for Zoro, but that Oda has still managed to find a way to bring Ryuma back into the main story, introducing him as some sort of great, great, great great grandfather or grand uncle or some sort of distant relative or ancestor of Zoro. And this seems to have led many to question whether Pao is going to get the same treatment. Will Pao come back into the main story to become some distant relative of Luffy's? Will Pao come back into the story to be revealed to be the original Joy Boy? And in speculating this, some are also taking the earlier ideas that Oda has revealed, namely the idea of Mary. So not Mary, Kai Kaya's sheep butler, or Mary as in the going Mary, but Mary also existed as early as 1994 as a 5,008-year-old rubber tree spirit. And now, people are speculating that this early conception of Mary somehow relates to the idea of Nika and the Nika devil fruit, and that this is also relevant to the lore of the series. So let me back up here, because Mary is designed to be this jolly, constantly laughing spirit. And he is an old personified form of a rubber tree that has a will of its own. And of course, this is fascinating for many reasons, because as we have established, Mary is an actual existing character in the One Piece canon. He's Kaya's butler during the Syrup Village arc, and that also resulted in the Straw Hat's first ship being called the Going Mary, or Mary for short. And much like the original designs for Mary, being a personified spirit or the will of an otherwise or a usually inanimate object, Mary in this series was also the spirit or the will of Mary the ship taking the form of a Klauber Talman. And I never know if I say that right. Klauber Talman. Klauber Talman. Anyways, so this idea of the spirit of a rubber tree is very interesting. And it's also more interesting because we also know from both versions of the Romance Dawn prototypes that the Gomu Gomu no Mi and devil fruits in general were supposed to have spawned from this idea of a devil tree or a devilish tree. This mystical tree is a legendary tree that's said to have appeared only once every 50 years. No, no, no. I think it's said to have fruited. It's only, it only fruits every 50 years. And the Gomu Gomu no Mi is one of these very rare, special, legendary fruits. And so that explains the origins of the devil fruits, which is an idea that may have been discarded for One Piece. We don't know for sure, actually. We can't say that for sure, because the lore and the origins of devil fruits in the One Piece canon are still yet to be revealed. But this reveal of Mary, the spirit of the rubber fruit tree, is 
really significant because when Luffy's Gi fifth form was revealed during the Wano arc and the truth of his Nika Devil Fruit when that was first revealed. That was pretty much the biggest, the hugest thing to have happened in One Piece. It's something that turned the series completely on its head. It changed everything we thought we knew about Luffy and his Devil Fruit, about potentially the nature of Devil Fruits in general. And I know it even caused some people to wonder whether that whole Nika Devil Fruit thing was a retcon by Oda. You know, how could the Gomu Gomu no Mi, something that we were introduced to from the very beginning of the series, literally from chapter one of One Piece. How could that be a completely other devil fruit entirely? You know, many wondered, is this something that Oda knew and considered from the very beginning? And I would argue that there is a lot uh, to suggest that, yes, it was suggested from the very beginning that the Gomu Gomu no Mi was a lot more special than we realized. But I think at the least, this prototype of Mary really cements the idea that Oda has always had in mind of an always laughing devil fruit spirit, a devil fruit will, a devil fruit with a will of its own, which we know that the Gomu Gomu no Mi does have. And so it's fascinating to think about how much of this original idea will remain for the rest of the lore surrounding devil fruits and the legendary sun god Nika that is yet to be revealed in the series. I mean, Will Sun God Nika be revealed to have existed 5,000 years ago? Or 5,008 years ago to be exact? Is it going to be revealed that all devil fruits spawn from a mysterious tree? All devil fruits, all devil fruits have a will of its own, not just mythical Zoan devil fruits, as has been suggested in the series. But I guess it's also worth considering, now that this guidebook has been released, Will Oda now abandon the idea because he thinks it's too predictable? And we did just go into deep speculation territory there. But even looking at forward the prototype for its face value, I think it just brings so much depth into the series and so much depth into the characters. Because even if we go back to how Yuma eventually became Zoro, there is much more to the story. Starting with the fact that as early as Oda developed the prototype for Zoro, he also knew that he wanted a Sanji in some form. Now Sanji back then wouldn't have been called Sanji in 1994 because back then Oda thought of a Romeo and perhaps most interestingly Sanji or Romeo, Romeo was also planned to be a swordsman. So according to these prototypes dating around that 1994 era, Sanji was going to be the westernized parallel to Ryuma, who is obviously the Japanese samurai, and Romeo was going to be a knight. And so even the names sound similar, you know, Romeo and Ryuma. It's like a anglicized version almost. And Romeo would also be a great swordsman and it's said that the two would often find themselves fighting each other or squabbling even in the most dire situations, such as when facing a dragon. And I mean, come on, does that sound familiar or what? So apparently this swordsmanship rivalry is something that he wanted to portray in Monsters. If you've read Monsters or if you've watched the animated version, you will know that that's an idea that he eventually discarded because we don't have a Romeo in Monsters. Because it's also said that his desire in creating Monsters was also centered around wanting to draw a double spread or a double page of a dragon being slain, being slayed. But he did also want to draw a clash between a rough samurai versus a noble knight. And he actually uses a cooking analogy to explain this, which I found very apt given that Romeo would eventually become Sanji the chef. So he likens this image in his head to homemade miso soup versus a refined marinade in a cowboy's film with a side of dragon soup and a refreshing chivalry's rosé. And that's that's a lot to unpack there. But you do definitely get the sense that Oda really wanted a rough and tumble, brutish swordsman, which we did get in the form of Zoro, versus a chivalrous, 
refined knight, which we didn't get a knight in Sanji, but the idea of a clean, chivalrous man, you know, all tucked up in a suit, that remains very true of Sanji. Although I have to say that I love the idea of Sanji being originally named Romeo and Romeo the knight, because that really, for me, paints a picture of a shining knight in armor who all the ladies swoon for. And then what we eventually got was Sanji the simp who has no luck with ladies or very close to zero luck with ladies. So that's hilarious. And we have seen from other concept designs that the design for Sanji has also changed throughout the years before he eventually became a chef. We've also seen him, you know, with guns as his choice of weapon. I've also seen this image of a ninja and a sorcerer. Supposedly ninja being the early design for Zoro and, and the sorcerer being the early concept for Sanji. But I'm not really too sure how legitimate this photo is because it hasn't been shared very widely or it hasn't been shared by any news sites as far as I know. And also personally, the art style doesn't quite look the same as Oda's typical drawings. But I guess it would be a cool idea if true. It still fits the idea of Zoro being much more Japanese inspired, whereas Sanji would be sort of the parallel but westernized. Or even the fact that Oda really considered so many multiple ways to bring that Zoro versus Sanji rivalry to life. And there is actually still more to how Ryuma eventually became Zoro. And this actually just happens to relate to another manga series that I just completely adore. A manga series called Slam Dunk, which probably I have to say is my all-time favorite manga aside from One Piece. And this series was created by the very talented Takehiko Inoue-san, who also created Vagabond. Beautiful artworks, highly recommend. But in relation to One Piece, so I didn't actually originally know this before, but for Slam Dunk, apparently Inoue originally intended or made Rukawa, the Juro protagonist in Slam Dunk, Rukawa was originally planned to be the protagonist in an earlier concept of his manga, but then the character eventually became the, the Juro protagonist, Juro protagonist, Juro, Juro protagonist. Deuterogonus. How do you say that word? Second main character in Slam Dunk. And if you're familiar with the series, then you will know that Rukawa is arguably the most talented, the coolest basketball player in the series. And for many fans, he is their favorite character. And well, Oda was supposedly very impressed by this, and so Oda decided to create monsters where he could take the supposed Deuterogonist and make him the main character, which is essentially what he did because he took Ryuma, which we know to be the early design for Zoro, and made him the protagonist because he wanted a series where a character so cool could be the protagonist. And according to other sources, it's also said that Oda has also stated earlier that although he had always planned for a character like Luffy to be the main character of One Piece, he also prepared a character like Ryuma to be the deuterogonist in order for the series to be popular. So not only does this sort of confirm that Oda thinks of Zoro as like the second main character, it seems that Oda knew, always knew that Zoro was going to be a major selling point. Now, I would personally say that although Zoro is part of the main character suite, I don't know if it's always super clear that he is necessarily the second main character. I don't think the way that Oda has written One Piece is so simple like that, but I'm sure a lot of fans are very happy to hear that Oda has in some way almost confirmed that Zoro is indeed the second main character. Anyways, the guidebook didn't only contain information about the male characters or about the monster trio, because we also get information about what seems to be the early concept for Nami in the series. In Forward, Nami was at some point going to be a character named Rizel or Rizel. So we have also seen from other prototypes, I guess in both the Romance Dawn prototypes, prototypes, there was always going to be some form of Nami, some Nami-esque, a female character that always existed. And in fact, in those earlier prototypes, that Nami figure seems to have actually always been planned to have been the deuterogonist. So not Zoro, but Nami. And that also explains why she's in the color spread for chapter one of One Piece. You know, we see in the actual One Piece series in chapter one, in the color spread, Nami's present alongside the red-haired pirates, 
despite the fact that she's actually not present in the chapter itself and that we actually wouldn't be seeing her until after we meet Zoro in the series. So I guess that potentially links back to the influence of Slam Dunk, of Rukawa and Oda's ultimate decision to make Zoro such an important character in his story because we have also seen how Oda's conception for Zoro has changed throughout the years. You know, we've seen in other concept designs that this bandana wearing swordsman was once going to be a part of Buggy's crew. And then of course he eventually cemented his spot as Luffy's right hand man in One Piece. And I think that was a great decision because I definitely agree with Oda that Zoro, having a character like Zoro, has really done a lot for One Piece's popularity. But anyways, going back to Nami. So to be honest, I can't actually tell much from these drawings of Forward about Rizelle as a character. She seems like a very nice lady. Uh, I have to say that I much prefer the Nami that we ended up with because although I can't say much based on one drawing alone, the design sort of lacks character. She just seems very nice and gentle. She doesn't have the same sort of spunk that Nami has. And given how Nami has ended up with Oda's original plan for Pal, i.e. Nami ended up becoming the cat burglar, you know, she became the thief. I think that makes Nami as a character so much more interesting and so much more fun. Also, like Pal, I can't really comment or speculate on the significance of the name itself because the Roselle seems to have many different meanings or roots across different cultures. For example, in the Philippines, it means gentle, which like I said, Roselle does look like a very sweet, very gentle character. But it could also be interpreted to be some sort of alternate spelling or interpretation of the name Raziel and Raziel or Raziel is an angel according to Jewish mysticism and Raziel is known to be the angel of mysteries or the angel of secrets. But we also know that the name for Nami has changed many times throughout Oda's conceptions for One Piece. You know, in the two Romance Dawn prototypes, each time Nami had a different name, being Silk or N depending on which version of the Romance Dawn you're reading. So I guess maybe the Roselle name might not be very important, but who knows, maybe Roselle herself will also come back, much like some speculations about Pau and about the original Mary. You know, maybe there's more to Nami's ancestry that we haven't found out yet. Again, I guess maybe we'll see. Based on the design, it looks like Roselle might have been given a cap. A cap with an inscription that I can't quite make out. Looks like maybe triple S, maybe triple five. I don't know if that's supposed to be part of some sort of uniform. So maybe if Luffy was a thief, was the idea that Nami would actually be like the bounty hunter or would like, you know, be the military or the authority figure in the series. I thought I remembered an early sketch of Nami with a cat from some other concept designs, but I haven't been able to find it since. So I guess maybe I just remembered it wrong. Or maybe I'm just thinking of the live action because I think Nami once wears a marine cap as a disguise in the live action series. Anyways, moving on. That is, I think, the end of all the guidebook material that we got. But I did also promise a very sweet story between Oda-san and Asada-san, so here it is. So like I said, I haven't actually seen confirmed that it is Takanori Asada who released this guidebook material because all the accounts I've read just refer to him as Oda's first editor or One Piece's first editor. But like I said, my understanding is that Asada was Oda's first editor or One Piece's first editor. And I may even go out and say that he may be Oda's greatest fan. Because the story goes that Asada-san was an editor who had been working at Shonen Jump for a couple years before Oda, before One Piece was even serialized. And apparently back then, Oda was a relative newbie in the industry and he had submitted One Piece to Shonen Jump several times and each time it got rejected. And this really frustrated Asada-san who really enjoyed Oda's story and believed that it would be a big hit. And apparently Asada-san grew so frustrated that his bosses just wouldn't understand, couldn't see how awesome this series was. He's even once said that he got so mad that one night he dreamt about beating his bosses. And then another day that he actually relentlessly, relentlessly tried to convince one of his bosses to pick up One Piece for the magazine. And apparently he did so from 9pm to 7am the next day. So 
that's a lot of persistence. So eventually One Piece did enter Shonen Jump and I guess as they say the rest is history but I think that is really really sweet and I think that means we owe everything to Asada-san because without him we may have never ended up with One Piece. So if this guidebook material was also from the work of Asada-san then many thanks and even if not thank you for gracing us with the presence of One Piece in our lives. And there is actually more to this sweet relationship between Oda-san and Asada-san and if you want to hear more then I guess subscribe to the channel because maybe I'll share more in another video of mine. Regardless if you enjoyed the video then please do like the video, please subscribe to the channel because we will always be discussing more One Piece. A huge thank you also to the tireless work of all of those who translate all of this extra material so that the rest of us non-Japanese speaking plebs can read it and enjoy it. Thank you for listening and sticking it through this video and thank you to our patrons and our channel members for your support and if you would like to support the channel further then you can also become a Patreon or channel member. This is Joy Girl and I'll see you again soon.